I, um, I, want to, uh, I want to talk a little bit. Obviously, it's Mother's Day, so I want you guys to, to see um, my mom. Uh, this is my mom. Um, she's going to kill me. Uh, and, and I post that picture. Obviously, there's plenty of other pictures, but uh, um, this is the one that best represented my mom to me. I, I, I think of my mom as a, a person that's very fun, uh, very loving. I wrote some stuff down. I'm probably going to cry. I told myself last night I, I wasn't going to because you all see me cry way too much. Um, but one of the coolest things in what Tim was uh, sharing, one of his fondest memories, one of my greatest memories or one of the things I hold on to the most is that when you go to my parents' house, and I remember this all uh, through high school, uh, there was prayers on the refrigerator that my mom wrote out for me, my brother, and my sister, and they would be written on uh, the um, They'd be written and posted on the refrigerator. I heard uh, Dr. Charles Stanley say this one time, and I'm not sure that I 100% agree with him, um, but he said if um, God doesn't answer prayers for people that have unrepented sin, and I was sitting in my car thinking That's, that can't be true, that can't be true. God keeps blessing me. Uh, even when I'm doing stupid stuff, I can't, sometimes I'm overwhelmed with the blessings that I get in and, and, uh, Dr. Stanley said God doesn't um, uh, answer the prayers of those with unrepented sin. And I thought, man, that's not, that's not the case. And then what he said uh, absolutely overwhelmed me. He said, but God will answer the prayers of others for you. And instantly, that's the picture that was painted on the, on the wall for me. I'm not going to do this. Uh, that my mom prayed for me. And, and uh, what a beautiful thing to know that our, our parents back us up and, and uh, are continually praying for us. And, and what a tough job. I, I wrote that my mom went to a lot of games and things like that. My mom is a good cook, as you can tell. Um, my mom is funny, and this is the kind of stuff that she does. My, my kids have voted her the craziest person that they know. Uh, she's not sure why, but if you're around, you'll figure it out. And um, uh, this kind of leads up to where I'm going to today. My mom... Uh, will invest in other people, and, and I just think about her job, uh, what she does, and uh, um, she's worked at a school now for years, and she's kind of been my dad's helpmate and help him get, and if you're ever around my dad, like his brain is on different things all the time, so with, my mom has to keep up with that uh, and, and figure out where dad's going and what, what he's got on the plate next, and uh, she takes care of kids all day, and um, uh, she, she, they, people think that she's a doctor, and she's not. And, but she really is very uh, intelligent on that and knows a lot of that. Uh, she gets accused of making it snow a lot for her snow dance. You'll have to ask her. I, I'm going to stay out of that. Um, and all over the country, I was just thinking about this, all over the country, uh, there are young people that call my mom Aunt Kay because of the investing she, she did in their lives. Um, I'm not going to get there, so... I'm not going there. Uh, so um, that brings me, uh, it's not just my mom, brings up this other lady here. <laughs> She's going to kill me. I just destroyed this Mother's Day. <laughs> so my mom has influenced my wife a whole lot. <laughs> And she just said she hates me, so, um, no, I, I was thinking about, go ahead and pull up the next one, they don't need to stare at that all day. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I was thinking about it, my, my wife grew up differently, and, um, um, and uh, all right, y'all going to have to see it, I guess. Um, um, she grew up in a, in a, different denomination and different background and uh and not that they're not believers it was just done differently and um uh i never i'm selfish i i never asked my wife if she wanted to be a pastor's wife and uh and it was probably been really tough on her um But my mom has already been through it. So 
um, I believe that my mom has been, I can't do this stuff. I need a different profession. <laughs> Be the guy behind the scenes. My, I believe my mom has influenced my wife and shown her a, a great walk. And uh, there is a, there's something special to me has been watching um, my wife learn to fall in love with Jesus. There's something special when you walk in and see your Bible open. When I hear her pray, um, and then knowing that um, there's a next generation that she'll be bringing up. She works at a daycare and, and with our kids and my own daughter and, and my son. And um, We have to do this legacy thing and leave a legacy. And so the title of my message, if you'll pull it up, is, and I'm going to get through this real quick because i got a couple testimonies, so I'm not even going to spend a lot of time. You're not going to hear from me a lot. But the title of my me message is Legacy, Outlive Your Life. And, and uh, one of the things that I remember, I went to Evan Humbert's funeral, uh, who was uh, a teacher at Lord Fairfax, and, and this stands out to me, and I know you've probably heard me say it a few times, but it really jumped out at me because they had his, uh, his uh, mentor stand up and share a little bit about him, and, and his mentor said, Evan would reach out to me, Evan was always reaching up, trying to get better himself, and then he said, but the really neat thing about Evan, and this is the part that, that jumped out to me, is Evan would reach out, and at the same time, he was always reaching back to help somebody else. And, and what a picture that is of what we're supposed to be and who we are supposed to be uh, in Christ, that we are not only just reaching out to Christ or finding a mentor that helps us grow spiritually, but there's always somebody, right, that's in the same spot that we were that needs the same hand of reaching back to them. And so outlive your life. And, and I started thinking about this. It, one, of my, one of my stories, like, uh, I didn't want kids at all. I, I, uh, I showed up at a kindergarten graduation and was watching little kids read scripture all the way through the alphabet. And, and, and it was one of the neatest things uh, I ever saw. And I did it when I was a kid, but just standing there watching it. And, and I, uh, there was people over at my house and they were playing video games and stuff. And, and, and so I didn't want kids. Christi I said, Christine, I'm too busy for kids. And so uh, I, 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 I uh, walked in the door and I said, Christine, um, God did something to, to me at kindergarten graduation and uh, I think it would be all right if we have kids. And she went, oh good, I've been wanting to tell you something. <laughs> God didn't give me much time to rethink that. Um, and so we found that out, and, and right before that, my grandmother had, um, had passed away, and my mom had been struggling, and obviously, like anybody that loses a mom, my mom was struggling and missing my, we called her Gaga, and we were missing her, and, and so uh, on, on her birthday, uh, we gave, um, uh, uh, was it her birthday? I can't remember what it was, Mother's Day something, I can't remember. Uh, we, we wrapped up, it was my dad's birthday. We wrapped up a pair of baby Jordans, and uh, gave my dad a pair of baby Jordans and then gave my mom a, a gift and all that. And the, and the cool part was um, our card to my mom said, um, you may have lost Gaga, but now you get to be her. And, and the, the point behind that is my grandmother had outlived her life. That all the things that she had learned and all the things that she, all the experiences and all the things that she had gone through as a as a, a a mother were passed down to my mom and now being passed down to you know my wife and my kids and and so learning to outlive your life isn't that a beautiful concept that that we're not just here for us that that we're not just supposed to love God but we're supposed to love people and so uh, that's where we get to today and I want to get uh, to this um, you all have heard me say this to whom much is given. All the new people are like, what? I haven't said that a lot lately, but man, if there was a message for that today, it's that. To whom much is given, much is required. And like I said, I'm going to get through these quick. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 25 and go on to the next one for me. I want to read to you this little parable, and it says, Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. And so here's this picture in the Scripture. This is a parable that Jesus is telling. And he's, uh, the, I, I'm picturing him as being the person that's entrusting. And, and, and look at that word entrusting, because God has entrusted you. Listen, don't, don't, don't mistake this. God has given you your life. He's given you. He's given you your challenges. 
Now, he wants you to overcome. His desire is for you to be prosperous. Your, his desire is for you to overcome. But he's also allowed those temptations. He's also allowed those challenges to come into your life. And he's entrusted you. The God of the universe trusts you. Wow. What a responsibility. And it says, uh, he entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold. And to another, two bags. And to another, one bag. Uh, one bag and each according to his ability and um, I like that part too, his ability. Because we're all made different. God didn't give us all the same gifts and talents. And so if you're sitting at a church comparing your Christianity to the person beside you, you've missed it. God created you, designed you, fearfully and wonderfully made you, took time out of his schedule. The master of the universe puts you together. So don't you dare look at the person beside you and go, man, they seem to be way more, doing, more, way, doing way better than I am, doing way more than I am. God created you for what he gave you. And you should be happy with that, be satisfied with that. And go on to the next verse, Matthew 25, 16 and 17. It says, the man had received five bags of gold, went at once, and I, I put this, he put it to work. He put it to work. He took his experience he took what God gave him and he said okay I'm going to take what's been given to me and it seemed like oh okay you got more so uh you can do more and, and that's how we think as Christians that's how we think as people oh if, if he had that if I had that guy's circumstances or if I had that guy's wealth or if I had that guy's family life and we do that a lot but this guy it says that he put it to work and then it says he gained five bags more he doubled it so also the one with the two bags also gained two more. So this guy also, he's done that. And then we're going to get through these kind of other things. But watch this in Matthew 25, 18 and 19. It says, but the man who had received one bag went off and he dug a hole in the ground and he hid his master's money. And if you look at this story, a lot of times this, people think this is about heaven and hell, this whole story. And it's not. It's about all the experiences that God has given you, and a lot of us, if we're reading this story, if you're reading this parable, we want to put ourselves at this guy. This is probably the guy I am. I'm the guy that uh, kind of hides it or dug a hole, and I just really have this love God thing, because that's really what it comes down to, and we'll see that here as we read on. He really is just taking care of the master. God, I didn't want to hurt you, or master, I didn't want to offend you, so I kept all your money, I didn't lose it. And, that's, and so he's just got this him and God thing. The other two guys had this investing, which means that they had to um, communicate with other people. There had to be some stuff going out and coming back in and for this to work. Now watch this. Matthew 25, 19, it says, uh, uh, yep, After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled their accounts with them. And, and, and we can get this picture. After a long time, maybe meant at the end of their life. At the end of their life, the master comes and he wants to settle the accounts with them. So everything is going to come down to, what did you do with what I gave you? Listen to me. What did you do? Church, listen. This didn't just show up on Sunday mornings. This is about your life. What did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with I uh, put this next verse up there. kind of jumped in my mind. Romans 14, 12. It says, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. And I put that, I put that guy there because that's kind of what we think, right? Isn't that kind of the thought that we have in our mind? Uh, uh, uh-oh, I'm going to have to give an account of um, what's been done. And, and I don't know if it's, it probably wasn't the way it was intended or maybe it was. I don't know. But we always have this like, there's a big video screen up in heaven and God's going to sit down and show us everything. Does anybody else have that thought? No? Don't lie. Some of you have. Yeah, we're going to sit down and, and, and we're going to get to watch everything that we've ever done and that seems to scare us really bad. But then we're like, yeah, but I get to see what so-and-so did too. And then that kind of intrigues us. And we're like, but, but it's not like that. It's not like that. But at the same time, I want you to see this. Um, uh, there is this idea. Uh, and, and I wrote this down in my own notes. Do I get to give an accountability of what I, I've done in my life? Or do I have to? Do I get to? Listen, that changes everything, doesn't it? Do I get to or do I have to? Do I get to? Or do I have to? Now watch what happens in Matthew 25, 20. It says, the man who received five bags uh, of gold brought, brought the other five. Mastery said, you've entrusted me with five bags of gold. And then look, I highlighted the word see. See the picture there? He's excited. 
Like he's given his accountability. See? Imagine getting to heaven and having that, that, um, that mentality. See? See what I've done? See what I did with what you gave me, God? See what I did? See, he, he's looking at it as a, I get to, and not I have to. Uh, and then it says, uh, I have gained five more. And then Matthew 25, and then we're kind of seeing a repeat. It says, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And then he kind of does the same thing in Matthew 25, 22, and 23. It says, the man with the two bags of gold also uh, came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags. See? I have gained two more, his master replied. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. And I highlighted that master's happiness because this, look, if we want to know what brings God glory, it's how we invest with other people what he's given us. The way that you make God happy it's not how many Bible scriptures you can read in the day or how many Bible verses you can memorize or how long you pray. Not how many times you show up to church. Not how many Bible studies you're in. It's not any of that. It's how you've invested what He's given you back to somebody else. Figure that out. This will change everything. This will change the Sunday morning Christian. It'll change that. Because now I have to take what's been given to me, to whom much is given, much is required. I have to take what's been given to me and I have to give it away. Go on to the next one for me, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 11. Look what it says. It says, my grace is sufficient for you, for your power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. This is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. When I am weak, I am strong. And, and the reason I wrote that is because that's where we kind of hang out. That's where I kind of hang out. I'm just the guy that got this much. Or, uh, and maybe some of you, you've been through, and I wrote some different things down, some of you have been through some, um, maybe some bad marriages or financial decisions, or maybe uh, you've had some mental issues or, or whatever it is. Maybe, maybe you have some kids that are the prodigal child that have left, or maybe you've gone through some personal pain and you've gone through all this, but maybe maybe God's allowed you to go all through that, and you're, you're that guy with the one bang and you're saying, I'm going to hide it. Maybe you've struggled with an addiction. Maybe you're struggling with an addiction. Maybe there's all kinds of things that are going on that we don't know about. Why? Because you've done like this one man. We've taken and dug a hole and we've buried it and we just try to live this perfect Christian life forgetting, forgetting that we're supposed to invest what's been given to us back to other people. I'll share this myself. Um, um, one, of my, one of my own issues when I was growing up, I grew up in a religious church, and not that there wasn't some very good things because there were, but I, 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 let me take more credit for that. I was a very religious person. Regardless of what was being taught, I, I took it some things differently, and, and I got very Pharisaic, and, and, and in school I knew the right things to say, I knew the right things to do, I knew the right places to be, uh, I knew who to flatter and, and, and who to be mad at or seem like I was mad at, I knew all of that, and so um, my, my uh, investing is, my, the coolest thing that I get to do, I get to speak to, to uh, Christian school kids all the time. I've gotten to see revival break out in Christian schools because of my... Because God used my experience and my hurts and my, my lies and my defeats. I was listening to the, the, the principal at You Carry a Christian Academy where my daughter goes. And, and uh, uh, he was sharing they've got this great program over there uh, for mentally, uh, uh, mentally kids that have handicaps and, and uh, struggle with learning disabilities and things like that. And, and I got to hear this for the first time. He was sharing his testimony on Wednesday at chapel when he said, I struggled as a kid. I was the kid that was always slow. I was the one that they were putting in special classes and they thought I needed all this professional help and all these things and I just learned differently. And that's why I put this school together. And God has used my pains, my struggles, my hurts, my weaknesses to make me strong. Man. 
And so some of us are sitting in here today and you've got some things buried. Maybe you won't even tell your kids who you were and what you've been involved in. Well, maybe that's exactly what they need to hear so that you can protect them and help them and help them get through in those challenges. I share this all the time about the girl at the block party. They hated God. She said, I believe that there's a God, but I hate him because I was raped and abused when I was a kid. And, and she asked me, she said, why do you think God let me go through that? And I said, you know what? There's a little girl that's running around in this park that's going to go through the same thing. And I hate to even think about that, but she's going through the same thing and she needs a hero. She's going to need someone that overcame this and won. It's the same power that lives in Christ Jesus that raised him from the dead lives in us. And what a, what a legacy we have to, to learn to leave. And I, I wrote down a, uh, Matthew, 25, 20, uh, Matthew 25, 24, and 25. I'm speaking fast because I want to get to these testimonies. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came, Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man. He's just got this love God thing, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. I went out and hid the gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you, God. I'm just going to give you back what you gave me. It's just going to be about me and you. That's not the picture. Matter of fact, look what it says. It says, his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. Go on to the next one. You wicked, lazy servant. You knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with bankers so that when I returned it would have received it back with some interest. You should be able to bring me more. Then what I gave you, listen, church, you should be able to, even at the, at the weakest, you should have been able to bring me more than what I gave you. I want you to see this. Go on to the next one. These are just a few quotes, and then we're going to get to these testimonies. Your hurt can be somebody else's hope. Your hurt can be somebody else's hope. Go on to the next one for me. And I believe this is true. You can learn more from your failures. You do learn more from your failure than you ever learn from your successes. Isn't that true? When you think back on your life, then don't you pick up the wisdom and don't you start understanding way more when you've messed up? And, and doesn't that make sense that, that we've gone through that so that the next generation, so that the people that are coming up behind us don't have to go through the same thing that we went through? Doesn't it make sense that some of you, and, and, I, and I'm not going to, I don't want to bash or pull out anybody's dirty laundry or anything like that, but some of your failures were so that you can help somebody else prevent those same failures. Some of the struggles that you went through, some, some, some of the relationship issues, some of the financial issues, all of these things are given to us. A treasure given to us. And asked for interest. Asked that we do something with it. I also wrote this one down too, and, and this is where I'll end before my testimonies. Um, the value of a life is always determined on how much of it is given away. Isn't that the truth? When you show up at a funeral and... and and I was at uh, Mrs. Gaguzian's viewing, and, and many of you attended her funeral. And, and uh, there's, a, there's a beautiful funeral, and that's, that's even a strange thing to say. But when you realize how much has been given away, how much of their life they've given, isn't that true? Think about the people in your life that you honor and that you lift up and that you praise. And usually it's because somebody's come along and told you, even told you about their struggles. Hey, don't go through this. I already did that. I battled with that. I struggled with that. I, I want to help you. And, and we always have this picture. Listen, there always needs to be this picture of reaching up, obviously to get as close to God as we can. But don't you dare forget who's behind you. And so that, I want to say thank you to my mom and dad. Uh, it's, I know it's not Father's Day, but they both have invested in me. They both have gathered and tried to get as close to God as possible. And through their mistakes and through uh, the things that they've failed at and through their successes, uh, they were over to, I, I, I think, uh, I'm a pastor. And uh, that's out of my mom and dad reaching in and investing in me. And a lot of other people too, for sure, but not just reaching up, but also reaching back. And, and I want to thank my wife for, for doing that. And, and, and we have these ladies groups and all these things, but uh, it's really just awesome watching her love on my kids, pray with my kids, listen to my kids, 
and uh, be at all those games and, and being crazy with the stupid faces and all that. And, and I just enjoy listening to her laugh. And I, I, I just I love watching people taking what they've been given, investing into other people. So, uh, Denise, if you'll come ahead and we'll uh, have you share a little bit of testimony. I asked a couple moms to, to kind of share what they've gone through. And uh, that's kind of how we're going to end the day. And so it'll be her and then Barb Crone will come up after that. But uh, would you give Denise a hand? You can go, oh, yep. You just want to hold it? Don't put it over here. Me off. Okay, um, I'm Denise Morrison, and um, uh, Andy asked me to speak, and I always have plenty to say, no matter what, so he said to be brief, and I'm going to try <laughs> my best, um, because I have lived a very um, colorful, a lot of things have happened to, to me, personally. Um, I grew up in a Christian home, but I had the head knowledge, um, not the heart knowledge of Jesus Christ. Um, and uh, so Tim and I, ha uh, I, I always think that God blesses us even when we aren't where we're supposed to be. And I still believe, I do believe that because um, I was 17, 16 when I met Tim. Um, we met each other uh, in homeroom, which we had had class with each other the whole, the whole time, but I didn't recognize him or realize he was there until January. Um, it was like right before his birthday, and uh, we made eye contact. Um, and so, <laughs> I know. And uh, so, you know, um, I was probably I, I was a drug I was into drugs. Um, Tim was also, and so we were just looking to have good time, have fun. And so his girlfriend had broke up with him, and he didn't have anybody to skip with. And so I said I would go. So that just kind of tells you a little bit about um, I'm a pretty forward, flirty person. So um, we'll just say that. So um, we go we go on our, you know, date or whatever. We just kind of like traveled around and had a good time. And um, I had arranged for my mom and dad to know that I was at a friend's house, which I wasn't. Um, I learned very easily, quickly, how um, to believe my story so that they believed it. Anyway... He was a perfect gentleman. I had never met anybody like that ever in my whole life. So the Lord blessed me there because that's not what my mindset was at. Well, we end up starting to date. In March, he asked me to marry him. In um, April, I found out I was pregnant. So I'm 16 years old. Um, 17, uh, we got married. And then a month later, he went to boot camp. So we were only married for a month. And, um, but the Lord is blessing us this whole time because he really loved me, and I really loved him. Uh, so that's kind of like my basics of right there. Right there. So we ended up having a son. Uh, we live in North Carolina. And um, Tim and I are having a great time. We actually get to know each other because it's just us. We have no family to rely on, nothing like that. We're actually growing together and getting close to each other. Um, when we moved back after four years, uh, Tim went back to work for his dad for a little bit, but then he ended up getting on at UPS, which is a good job. So um, we had a house, we had cars, nice cars. We had um, a wonderful, wonderful life with Timmy and Nikki. Um, Nikki was born while she was in North Carolina too. Anyway, we, they did baseball games, we went everywhere. Um, with all kinds of things with them to do. And, and I always think of this as, well, we became drug, drug dealers. We actually got to that point. Um, but and if anybody else would look at us, they had no idea because I feel like we were living a secret life. In other people's eyes, they saw one thing, but what we were doing in our home was another thing. And in our mind, it was like we're not hurting anybody because they have the kids are doing activities. They play ball. We have, we have they have good friends, you know all these different things. And um, but it got to a point where Tim Tim ended up getting saved by Mr. G coming by, and Tim had asked him, 
um, how do I know? How can I just, how can I know I'm going to go to heaven? And, and Mr. G led him to the Lord. And um, he would come to the door and try to get us to go into bus ministry. And, you know, when you're in a bus ministry, they always find you no matter where you move. <laughs> and you end up, you know, that you end up picking up kids because Tim and I ended up in the bus ministry after that. But um, you end up picking up kids no matter where they end up. And they're like, oh, okay. So here they're back again. Um, but uh, Nikki, when she was eight, would say, Mom, you can ride the bus. You can ride the bus too. And I'm like, I don't, didn't want to do it because that was my time to do my thing and, um, and send them off. So um, I remember Mr. G knocking on the door one day, and he said um, it was one of the days I did open, open the door because usually I sent the kids to the door and I'd hide. Um, and he said, uh, do you know where you're going if you're going to heaven? And I'm like, yeah, I believe in Jesus. And he said, well, Satan believes in Jesus. And that's when it hit me because I did have knowledge, you know, from growing up in a church, but I didn't have the heart knowledge. I didn't actually make that commitment. So after that, um, we started going to church. Um, we, fig we figured we needed to um, do that because our kids were getting older and they didn't want to go if we weren't going to go. Um, and it wasn't, Tim stopped doing drugs immediately after he got saved. Um, it took me a little while longer, probably about eight months, um, because I still felt like if I was doing it in private and I wasn't bothering anybody and I wasn't hurting anybody else, it was okay. But um, one day I realized that if, the, if somebody, this is my mind, I'm thinking the wrong person comes to open the door, um, my kids could be taken away. And that was somewhere I didn't want to be. And so um, I even would be, I was so bad that I would get up in the morning, um, I would hit the bong, a little bit later I'm getting ready, do some coke, got too, too speedy, so I'd hit the bong again, and then I'd go volunteer at my kid's school. And they didn't know, nobody knew. Um, and I, the Lord started convicting me of these things, that this is not the what I have for you. Um, and a lot of things happened. We told Timmy when he was 12, what our life was like and what we didn't want him to do because he was starting to become angry and you know he was already going through the, the different things that we could tell that what um that we were losing him you know not to having that relationship and um so we was honest with him and told him and uh, he already knew what was going on he just never said anything um but you know we did what we were supposed to do and what he was going to do with that was going to be his choice, even though he was younger. And I think he did okay for a while. But once he got or started going around other people, I think, in it, you know, I don't really know what his reasons are, but he ended up becoming a drug addict. Um, we lived through a lot of different things during the last years. Um, uh, Nikki ended up um, getting sick with Guillain-Barre. Uh, Timmy had already ran away from home. Um, we had, uh, Faith was just born. She's... 18 years younger than her brother, so I almost got there. <laughs> um, and they all have the same dad. <laughs> but um, our life was, we were, we were preparing for faith, and faith was going to be brought up in a Christian home. She was going to have those totally different than what the other two had. And let me tell you, Nikki was a light, always had been a light in our life. Um, we would walk by her bedroom, and she would ha be sitting on her bed reading her Bible. And we never asked her to do those things. She just did that. And um, I, re I believe that's why the Lord used her in, when she had her guillain -Barre. She wanted her brother to become close to the Lord again. And she went up at the, when you, Andy talks about the revival they had at SVCA, and Nikki was so sick, but she did not want to miss anything. They had the bonfire. They threw their, their kids through their, their CDs and all their things in the fire. And, um, promised to change their life they really wanted to do it and Nikki went up front and said that she would told the Lord she would do anything um, just to reach her brother the next day her hand her, t her fingertips and her toes were numb and that's where it all began um, Tim said she was in the hospital for two months she was in ICU she she became um, pretty much a vegetable um, they told us that there was a 75% chance that she wasn't going to survive. And if she didn't survive, that it was a 95% chance that she would never walk again. And so we were like, well, we're, we're just going to get through this, you know. And I think that in a way we're kind of just being um, naive. 
but we didn't want to hear what they had to say. They wanted us to go home. We're like, uh, I don't think so. So we're there for 25 days. I slept in a chair most of the time. Tim was in the waiting room, but he was testifying to people the whole time. And I was the only one that could understand Nikki's chicken scratch <laughs> on her note because she somehow the Lord made it so her hand could move just enough. Um, Andy said, she's going to live. He had kids up there all the time. There was people there constantly. It was like having church at the hospital constantly. Um, I don't know how many people were reached by that. I mean, hopefully one day we'll find out, but it gives me cold chills to think about that. And it all started with Nikki being willing. I wouldn't have said that, and that's my own son. But she loved him enough that she had a relationship with God enough that that's what she wanted, what God wanted. And um, so, and I hope someday Nikki will be able to tell her testimony, but she won't talk about it. <laughs> but she prayed for people the whole time. People went to go see her and said, I want to encourage her, and she blessed me. She looked like an angel laying there. She could hear everything that was going on, even though she couldn't do anything because she was on uh, morphine and stuff. And she prayed for the people in the ICU. Um, it's just, it's amazing. Uh, you know, we got to think about things that aren't always negative. They might seem negative in our life, and we don't understand what we're going through, but there is always a plan. God has a plan, and he will use everything for his glory. And we don't want to be a stepping stone for that. Um, our tribulations are blessings. Um, Faith has been in a Christian home her whole life. I'm not going to say Tim and I are perfect, but um, she has an advantage that the other two didn't have. And, you know, we just promised God that if he allowed us to have her, that we would make sure she grew up in a, with Christian education. So that's kind of like, I'm at um, Legacy Christian Academy right now, but um, whether it had been homeschooled or whatever, but we just didn't want, that's what we wanted for her. Um, because I feel like God has something special for Timmy, even though he has walked away, but I think that he is allowing him to go through these things and he just isn't listening to God. Cause he has the, he has the seeds, he has the background. Um, and I'm still praying for that day when he walks in here or wherever. It may be. It might not be with us. But um, I just I praise the Lord that Nikki met Chris. And Chris already loved her before uh, she even was sick. But we have those beautiful grandchildren. They're fostering um, uh, Natalie. And hopefully one day she'll be, she'll be part of, I mean, she's already part of our family. But maybe they'll be able to adopt her. But um I just, you know, I think about what kind of a person I was at the beginning, and I was just so ruthless and willing to just step over top of people, really, because, you know, in my mind, guys had just, like, taken over and just didn't care. And so I got to that point, too, and I was just like, you know what? Oh, well. And uh, I was just going to want to have control of what was going on. And, um, but God watched over us. Tim and I will be married 35 years next month. And um, he's the most wonderful thing that's ever happened to me. I know God placed us into e e to each other, even though it was a weird way to say it, that we came together. But um, he has been blessing us our whole life. And, you know, we've been Christians now for, gosh, I don't know, Tim knows, 22, because um, I don't even think about it. I just go in the present. But anyway... Um, I just encourage you that whatever it is that you have in your life, and you know, guys, I could talk about all kinds of stuff, but um, don't be afraid to just tell people where you come from because you know what? He's washed you of that. That's right. Amen. And so you don't have to pay the price for that anymore, but your testimony, things you have lived through, is going to help somebody else. Right. He didn't let you go through it for nothing. That's right. Amen. Okay? Sorry that was long. I was glad to see Denise brought up notes too, although she didn't use them. Um, Andy asked me how to do this testimony. He said to the child, lift it up. Is that better? Okay. 
Um, he said to be brief about the challenges of parenting, and I'm thinking to myself, how brief can you be about the challenges of parenting? <laughs> Um, also, my girlfriend posted this morning, uh, motherhood, where you can experience heaven and hell all at the same time. <laughs> I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's the truth. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that testimony starts with the word test. I think that um, at each and every day we go through tests and challenges, and God brings us those tests and challenges for a reason. And some of my reasons, um, I didn't realize that I was, the test I was going through with an abusive marriage, my first marriage, would later allow me to support women in the church Amen. that are going through the same thing. Um, I never thought in a million years that I would want to be a part of the women's ministry because, let's be honest, women are very dramatic. And I don't do drama, even though I do drama. I act. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't like drama. <laughs> I, was, I grew up a tomboy, and my best friends were mostly guys, and they were just, we were just, I was one of the guys. So um, I also didn't realize that my test over my custody battles with my ex-husband would later be able to support a mom in this church whose daughter was going through the same thing. I also didn't realize that the, the test of my infertility would later give me the birth of my miracle son. And to give me four children of one only I gave birth to, and of two which have turned their life away from God. And then there's people like Tim and Denise in this church that give me hope that one day my son will find his way back. So, oh, uh, see? <laughs> this is why I didn't want to do it. <laughs> um, but God knew this all along, that he was giving me these tests because he knew that I was strong enough to do it, and that one day I could stand in front of you guys and show you that he did do this, and he's led me. He's led me through it so I can be the hope for someone that might be hopeless right now. Amen. So that's my testimony in a in brief, less than five minutes, and I thank you guys for listening to me. Um, that, that also is evidence of what I was talking about. Even getting up here and sharing gives some of you hope to talk to them and somebody that's gone through some stuff that, uh, um, uh, some tough stuff. And so don't hide who you are. God's given you something. And it's a beautiful thing. And, and what he's been telling me the last couple weeks is that he never ever, 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 ever makes a mistake. And every single thing that we go through can be used for His glory. And what He's given us, one day we'll get an opportunity to have to give an accountability or get to give an accountability. And what a day that's going to be, right? God, look what I was able to do with all the struggles, all the gifts, all the things that I went through. And you used it for your glory. And that's what he wants to do with each one of your stories. And, and, and if you've got a story, man, we're going to start a video testimony ministry where we're going to videotape our folks and let you share your testimonies. And we're going to put it on almost like a I am second thing. And if you've never been to that, go check that out. But So that people in our church can hear your testimony because your story is supposed to bring glory. Amen? That just popped into my head. That's crazy. You'd have thought I wrote that down somewhere. Let's bow our heads and uh, thank God for what he's done and, and what he can do and what he wants to do. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, it would be foolish if, I, if we had church and we did all this praise and worship and talked about God and I never gave you an opportunity to meet him. And, and honestly, that's the only thing that matters. So this morning, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you say, Pastor, I don't know this God. I, I'm, in a, I'm in a whirlwind of trouble with things like falling out of place. I, I don't know what's going on, but... Um, what you're talking about, it seemed like there's some hope in that, and I, I want that. And so if that's you this morning, you'd say, I'd like to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I'd like to know this God that you're talking about. If that's you this morning, would you just look up at me? We're not going to embarrass you. Just look up at me and say, that's me. Would you pray for me? Amen. Christians, I think this message is obviously more aimed at us. Who are we affecting? 
what is the worth of our story? What are we going to do with all the things that we've gone through, the hurts that we have, the gifts that we have, uh, the, the, the relationships that we have, and God, uh, God wants, to, wants us to be able to stand in front of Him one day at the end of this life, and, and He's going to say, what did you do with what I gave you? Did you invest? Or did you hide it and dig a hole and bury it when I could have used it? I really could have used it. You say, Pastor, that's me this morning. God, if you'll, if you'll let me, if you'll let my story encourage or help somebody else, that's what I do, want to do. If that's you this morning, would you just look up at me and just say, yeah, that's me. I want my story to, I want my story to count. Amen. Amen. All over. Yes. Praise God. It can. It can. As a matter of fact, I'll guarantee you, he's already put people in place that need to hear from you and need to know what you've gone through. And uh, all we've got to do is have that courage. He said, you wicked, lazy person. You were afraid. Ask God for boldness this morning. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for what you've done here today. Thank you for the testimonies of Denise and Barb, God, and how you even used what they went through even again this morning, God. I pray that we would take what's been given to us, the hurts, the trials, the successes, the gifts, all of those things, all of those beautiful things that you've given us because you gave them to us. And there's an expectation because to whom much is given, much is required, God. So I pray that we'll take our lives and, and let them be, bring glory to you, Lord. Now we praise you for who you are. You're an awesome, awesome God. We thank you for our mothers. We ask a special blessing on them today. I thank you for my mom and my kids' mom. Just thank you so much for giving them to me and being uh, my mom. So, Lord, we just love you. Thank you for all you do. In your precious name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a good day.